Okay, so, and then just not, I'm just out of just how, how long does this normally take? It should be a half an hour or less. Okay, all right. So just, Thank you. <laughs> So uh, my name is Kevin Smith. Um, I'm the director of product development at Personal Finance Lab. Um, normally the demos are taken care of by my colleague who is sick today. So um, I'll oh, take no. care of them for her. She isn't, it's, not, it's not the virus, right? I certainly <laughs> hope not. I need her. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. But uh, so far it doesn't seem to be the case. So basically what I'm going to go Good. through here is our personalfinancelab.com website. Um, there's a few different major components to it. There is the budgeting game, which your students take on the role of a college student with a part-time job. There's going to be a couple of variations of that budgeting game coming up. I'll talk about um, when we get there. Um, we have a stock game, which is a realistic investing simulation. And we have a pretty wide-ranging curriculum library. Um, personal finance, economics, accounting, management, marketing. Um, we have a lot of different lessons built in there. So to get started, I'm going to log with my teacher account and just kind of go through the process of creating a class. So um, what we have on our platform is everything that you see as the teacher is the same thing the student sees. So you're going to have a pretty easy time understanding how they're going to use it, except you have this special page at the top here called administration, which gives you all of your teacher tools. So um, the first thing that you would have to do as a teacher is you would create what's called either a class or a challenge. Um, the class or challenge, basically, you pick and choose all the components of Personal Finance Lab that you want to be using for your class. So to start out, you just give it a name um, and the description. This is, there's a few different ways to get your students registered, but in all cases, this lets them know they're in the right place. Um, estimated number of participants. We used to have it where a lot of teacher would, teachers would group their students into pairs or teams of three or four on the same account. That doesn't really happen anymore, but this number is used basically for us to understand um, what kind of server load we should be expecting, so keeping the site running fast. Um, okay, but is there a limit? No. Um, we have okay. a charge per account, so but there's not really a hard limit. If you ha have extras, it doesn't really matter. Um, Contest, public or private, again, this depends on how you're having your students register. Um, I'm going to leave it as public for now just because that makes things a little bit easier for everybody. But if you end up seeing students in your class who shouldn't be there, you can turn it to private and require a password to get in. Uh, we don't really have many cases of this happening, but we had some teachers that had some concerns about it. So let me just make sure I understand. Is that the only difference between public and private is that it doesn't change the curriculum, it's just a matter of keeping those that shouldn't be there correct it's purely out. about registration got it okay um, registration window is when the students can create their accounts normally you would have your students come in basically all at the same time but especially in times like these where we're looking at distance learning the students kind of come in at their leisure so this kind of puts a window when they can actually create their accounts um, time zone impacts all kinds of time stamps throughout the site i assume you're going to be using pacific time so we'll use that um, there is a forum built into the platform that would allow students to post messages to each other. Um, generally speaking, this doesn't get used very often. If your school has any kind of learning management system, that'll probably do a better job. But we have had some cases, especially on some larger scale challenges with multiple schools where they want to use this. So you can turn it on or off for your class as well. Down here is live support. This goes to our support desk, and if you have any questions throughout any of the process, they're here to help. Um, and the next step is if you were to use a stock game, this is how you would set it up. Um, you can toggle it on or off for your class. Uh, I'll go through some of the settings real quick just so you understand what you're looking at. Um, the currency of the, the challenge probably going to be US. The trading dates when the students can come in and actually you know trade. Um, how much cash do they get to start with? Uh, are you going to give them interest on any cash they're holding? So if they're not investing, they'll get some interest on their cash. I'll probably set this about zero right now. Um, can they borrow money? Can they day trade? Can they short sell? Some minimum prices? Um, all kinds of just basic settings of how you want your students to be interacting with it. The settings down here, um, public portfolios would let your students see each other's trades and portfolios. So that can be good if you're just using it as kind of a side project where it's not really a competitive any competitive aspect. The downside to that is it can lead to the students just kind of copying whoever's in first. 
Um, but you can change these rules later. So you can turn public portfolios on for the first week while they get started and then turn them off, for example. Um, do you want your teacher account to appear in the rankings? Generally speaking, classes where the teacher is actively participating in the game and is in the rankings get a lot better engagement because it becomes a task of beating the teacher. Um, these other ones are really only used for more advanced like finance classes, so I'll skip them. Um, and there's a bunch more rules that you can set for your class. How many trades can the students place? Um, the really important one is trading notes. That means the students need to write why every time they place a trade, which is pretty important for their learning aspect. Yeah. Um, and then what can they trade? So stocks and ETFs, mutual funds, bonds are the most common. There's also some other stuff for more advanced classes if you're interested. Um, if not, you can skip it. Um, you can also do things like putting rules on how the students have to diversify their portfolios. Again, it's, it depends on how much you really want to focus on the investing aspect. Mm -hmm. um, down here is, excuse me, um, what exchanges in the world can they trade? We do have a lot of international exchanges available. Most classes just kind of stick to the U.S. and maybe Canada. Um, but that's, that's the gist of the stock game settings. There's a lot there. You can play around with them, but generally speaking, you're safe with the defaults. Um, next up is the budgeting game. So in the budgeting game, your students take on the role of college student in the part-time job. Um, it is part-time, which means they have a different number of hours. They work each week, so all their paychecks are going to be pretty different, and they need to understand how to work around that um, insecurity when they're building the budgets. So you get a lot of control over what happens in the budgeting game. Um, the budget game <laughs> dates is when it's available for your students to access. The months to complete, um, each month in the game takes about 20 real-time minutes to finish. Um, at the beginning, it, it's a pretty strict about 20 minutes for them to get the hang of it. As they get to month four or five and beyond, they'll probably be able to get it down a little bit so they'll go through it faster as they kind of understand what they're doing. Um, Excuse me, Kevin? So, sure. Excuse me? Do, could, could you set the months longer? Yeah, you can set it to anything a you want. A longer period? So we've had some school go oh, all the way up okay. to 60 months. Um, okay. 24 months seems about the length that students can keep their attention okay. from what we've seen. But um, Right, right. Okay, I was just curious. Okay. So, but one, one example is that right now the game is a college student part-time job. Um, later this semester, mm -hmm. we're introducing our full-time mode version, where the student has a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, um, there's going to be an ability for you to basically have a graduation threshold. So it would be 12 months of the student has a part-time job, oh. and then they'll graduate, get okay. their full-time job, and the game will change quite a bit. So there's a few different ways it can be used, but the basic one that we've seen most teachers use in the in an actual classroom is 12 months, just to keep the time constraint down a bit. Mm -hmm. um, how much cash do you want to give your students to start with? How much in their ch checking account? How much in their savings account? Um, what average rent are your students going to be paying? So when the students actually sign on, and I'll show you this, they're going to have some options around this average because they will have they, they can make a lot of choices in it. But this is kind of the average for the class. Same thing with all of their other bills. You set what everybody's paying, and you as the teacher do have the ability to come in here and change these over time. So you can give everybody a rent hike, or you can give a discount on gas when oil prices go down, depending on how involved mm -hmm. you want to be. And those are always there by default, did you say? Yes. The numbers there? OK. Yeah. So the numbers here um, basically keeps the game balanced. And uh, at the bottom here, mm -hmm. you can see what this actually means on average for your students. Um, the idea is you want them to be able to save about 10% of their income. If they can't save that much, then they're going to get into cases where they'll get a month where they just really didn't get many hours at work and it can put them into debt pretty quick. Okay. Um, you also set how much money they earn at their job and you set the income tax rate. 18% um, really just covers the federal taxes. So you can put this a little bit higher to cover any state income taxes you want to include. Um, and throughout the game, there's a bunch of events that happen. A lot of unexpected life events you can kind of have some control over what's going to happen to line up with what you want to talk about so in a, a class where you'd be going through things sequentially you might want to choose things that line up with the topics you're talking about in class each week if not you can turn everything on or everything off um, either way there's going to be a lot of stuff happening to the students throughout the game um, next up we have our curriculum library so you don't need to set all of your lessons right off the bat, but 
Um, and you can set as many as you want. So a frequent way teachers do this is weekly. So these are the tasks that I expect my students to get done this week. Um, the first set of stuff here, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, a lot of articles. So for example, this article here, what is a stock? This is some basic stuff the students need to do need to know in order to use a stock game. Um, all the articles are between 1,000 and 2,000 words. We use a lot of images, we use infographics, um, we use videos, and all of them end with a pop quiz assessment. So they're between three and five questions wrong. Um, they're not hard, they're not designed to be tricky, it's just did the student actually complete this lesson? Do it, yeah. Um, you can decide whether the students can retry those for a higher score or it's just going to save their first try to the gradebook. Um, the other types of activities, we have videos. There's a lot of um, tutorial videos built into the platform. Regardless of whether or not you require these, these are always available for the students. And a lot of these focus on how they, do they actually interact with the stock game. We have a couple for the budgeting game too. Um, so these first 10 actions that we have up here, we put them at the top because this is the stuff that, if you're using the stock game in your class, this is the stuff the students need to know in order to be successful in it. Just some very basic investing stuff. If you're not using the stock game, we can skip it. Um, same thing for this intermediate stuff. It's more stuff for the stock game. Um, if you're not using it, then we can skip it entirely. But the really interesting stuff gets down when we get into the subject matter. So personal finance, there's about um, 50 lessons in here all aligned to standards. You can mix and match, pick and choose which ones you want the students to complete. Um, for a distance learning class, it does help to break things up by week. We'd pick five or six related articles and assign it. Um, otherwise, we have some teachers that just kind of grab everything and give it to one thing that they just say is due at the end of the semester. Um, so we align these all to jumpstart standards for personal finance stuff. We also align to state standards where applicable. Um, so like I said, there's a lot of How articles. This, this, yeah, you probably aren't down to the state level like with our CTE standards, right? Um, at, for California, the California CTE standards, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, they look pretty similar. They are, they are yeah. similar. I know okay. that. So it covers almost entirely the same stuff. There might be one or two okay. things that, that are a little bit different, but generally speaking, they're pretty close. Okay. That's okay. Um, now these are nice. Activities. Do, do you mind, could you click on one of those, um, I'm just curious about, like you did on the stock game, if you could click on one of these in the personal finance area, just is it just really similar? Um, yeah, it's pretty similar. Um, in the personal okay. finance ones in particular, though, we have a little bit more interactivity on some of these. Um, one uh -huh. of my favorite ones, if I can find it, is What is Money, I think it was. And we do a few different things in here where no, it's not this one. It's a little short, actually. Oh, okay, but that that was nice to see, though. It's just very yeah. similar. Those are those are great. Yeah, some of them have extra um, stuff built in. How about budgeting? Could you click on budgeting? Sure. Okay. So Thank this you. Is... This one actually is a little bit shorter um, than our spending okay. plans one, but both of them kind of go through the fixed wants, variable wants, some best practices on doing it. Um, we mm -hmm. also have like a budget builder calculator that the students can use outside of the budget game, just kind mm -hmm. of as a lesson. Mm -hmm. And here we go, where the students can kind of put in how much they pay, how much they get getting withheld, and it kind yeah. of shows them pie charts of how this all comes together. And where did that come from? Was that at the end of this lesson, or did you just find it somewhere else? This one is a separate oh, lesson. Oh, home budget calculator. Yeah, got uh, it. This one is down okay. here in the activities. These aren't left oh, okay. on articles. These are just, we give the students a tool and we give them scenarios they need uh -huh. to use that tool to solve. So, okay, and just to make sure I understand, Kevin, are you saying that I could, I personally have to pop these in to their, to their lessons or some are there by default? Or? You basically check off the ones you want your students to do. So. And they just automatically pop into their yeah. dashboard or something? Exactly. They'll, they'll get a, like what we're doing right now is we're creating an assignment and here's the dates so when the students log in between these dates they're going to see i have an assignment okay. i'm expected to do these got things it. um got it okay so okay there's a lot of personal finance stuff 
Um, there's also a lot of economic stuff. A lot of states combine mm -hmm. their personal finance and economics classes. So right. there's a lot of stuff here too. Okay. Career prep. There's some basic stuff about applying for jobs and getting certifications and stuff. But in mm -hmm. our career center, we also have a job and internship database. These are all real jobs and internships. There's about 350,000 of them at any given time. And mm -hmm. we do have students that apply through internships through here, but the main use is when teachers are talking about career prep, they can kind of find your dream job and work backwards for how they can build a career plan. Um, okay. But like I said, these are all real ones. We pulled them in from a few different <laughs> job boards. So there's mm -hmm. like quite a lot of stuff it's to nice. do there. Uh, business. So we have a lot of accounting, management, and marketing lessons. These are aligned to standards, but we don't fully align to the standards just because we don't have a big enough curriculum library quite yet. Um, the bulk of our business curriculum is focusing on accounting principles. Um, management takes the second seat, and there's a little bit of marketing stuff at the end. Mm -hmm. um, down here, investing 101. So if you wanted to use a stock game just kind of a, as a fun thing you not, don't really want to focus on in class, the Investing 101 actually is a self-contained investing course, and you can just give the students all 10 chapters and they can go through it at their leisure. So instead of being mm -hmm. one article with one quiz, we organize these into chapters of, on average, about 10 topics. Each topic is a lot shorter, usually 250 to 500 words. Um, and at the end of each chapter, the student takes a um, exam a 10 question exam on that chapter okay so if you were interested in using this stock game at all and you didn't want to spend any class time on it it's a pretty good way to do it um, the other stuff down here you can require them to make certain kinds of trades in their stock game portfolio in the budget game you can require them to take certain actions um, I'll, these will make a little bit more sense when I show you the game but um, they need to spend a certain amount of time studying, and they need to spend a certain amount of time socializing with their friends. They need to use their credit card a certain number of times, that kind of thing. Um, okay. And in the mathematics section, we these are exercises that we take data from the stock game that the students build themselves, and we show them how to use Excel and Google Sheets to get um, useful information out of them. So importing and formatting the data, calculating returns, um, doing building graphs, and the advantage is that they're using their own data that they've generated themselves through their stock game. That's good. Yeah. So but that would only occur if they're doing the stock market. Um, you can include the lesson no matter what, um, but the examples mm -hmm. that are used in the articles refer to stuff they would have gotten from their portfolio. Okay. All right. So. Okay. Um, if you don't want to create your assignment right off the bat, that's fine. You just skip this step. But once you have, and I'll show you how you can create more later, but I did grab some stuff. Let's just grab some of the personal finance stuff. So I've got my assignment set up, and I click Create. So now my class is all set up. That's all you really need. Um, there's two ways to get the students registered. This link here. If you give this to their students and they're not logged in already, this will take them to a registration page where they pick their own username and password and they log in. Um, that's the most common way to do it. The other way mm -hmm. is you can use our registration file. This one would say, I don't want my students to enter any of their information, I just want to generate some accounts. So I would say my high school mascot of the night, let's get five accounts and we give you the usernames and passwords and you can give these to your students. Um, if you come back to the registration file later, then you'll see the list of your student usernames. We don't show you the passwords, but you can reset their passwords, you can change their usernames, you can do whatever you want here. Um, so I'm getting do, all my email confirmation. What do, it. <laughs> what do you recommend as far as, I mean, do you recommend the students Register them. So are you saying the students can register themselves, or I'm setting them up and then assigning? Yeah, the, you can do either way. I okay. recommend having students register themselves. Um, it makes your reports okay. easier because you'll have their name in here. Um, Got it. They'll pick their own username, okay. so they're going to like it better. Um, uh huh. The advantage of okay. generating the accounts is schools that just really don't want students to enter any personal information. They just want to keep track of it on their own. Okay. All right. Thanks. So 
now I'm good. Um, everything's set up. I'm a student. I just logged in for the first time. And this is what I see. So by default, they're taken to the stock game page. If you're not using the stock game, they're taken straight to the budget game page. Um, on the right side of the page here is the assignment my teacher set up for me with all the stuff that's required for me to do. Um, if I wanted to actually start building my portfolio in the stock game, I can make a trade right away. Here's a list of the most commonly traded stocks from other students on the platform. Um, otherwise, they can. No, it looks like I can't do that quite yet. Yeah, so um, if they don't know a ticker symbol, they can just start typing a company name and we give them the symbols that match. Um, there's a lot of really detailed quote information that's super easy to use. Um, scroll down, they see who is this company, what do they do, what news story is mentioning this stock, so why is the price going up or down, what's Wall Street saying about this stock, what's their price history. Um, they can get the financial statements for any stock going back um, 20 years, either annually or quarterly, and a lot of other information about you know PE ratios and all kinds of other stuff they might want to know. Um, oh, okay. So enter an amount, preview my order, this tells me how it's going to cost, including my commissions, and this is where the students would have to write that trading note explaining why they're making this trade. Usually just a sentence or two, but they can put it a little bit longer. So that's all good for the stock game. There's a bunch of stuff to keep the students engaged to. There's a rankings page that's real time. Um, they can see their transaction histories and close positions and all kinds of other things. Uh, but we are here mostly focused on the budget game, so I'm going to switch right over to that. Oh, wait, let's go to my new class for the budget game, actually. All right, so here I am starting my budgeting game. <laughs> Everything up, up here looks a little bit different. I have the my net worth that is the thousand dollars my teacher started me out with. I start with a 300 credit score, um, and all my other metrics are kept at track at the top of the page. So I click play, and when the student starts, they need to pick some of those basic settings of what they're going to do. They can change these later because uh, they're making this choice pretty blind right now. They don't know exactly how much money they're making or anything, but um, basically yeah, they're, they're going to have these options around that average you chose. So I'll pick the middle option for each one. And they progress through the game by clicking the dice. Um, they move forward half a day for each dice amount. So. To get them started, we give them a little bit of a mini lesson on their debit and credit cards because they're going to need to use those for basically everything they do in the game. Um, these are much shorter than those lessons in the assignments, and they use uh, examples straight from the budgeting game so they see how it works. Okay, excuse me. So are you saying that this is what you... Um, what's behind that pop-up right there? What's behind that dialog box that just popped up? Yep. Is that... Is that something you said is there by default, or I had to set it? No, this is here by default. So we have a sequence Got of it. stuff that the students okay. need to know to do the budget game successfully. And so oh gosh, this is that's great. Great in there yeah. for them. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, can, did you mind? Do you mind clicking on view again? I'm sorry, I just didn't sure. see what it said. Yeah. So this is a short lesson on the debit and credit cards, explicitly on how they work in the budgeting game. Mm -hmm. So explaining that their debit card takes money from their checking account, their credit card takes okay. money from their available credit, that kind of thing. Oh, that's great. Super. So okay. to Thank continue, you. they need to have read this. We always put a fun fact in there. They need to enter that amount from the fun fact to continue. So in this case, I now have a 20% credit card or a credit card interest rate. So I can submit and then I got a little bit of cash for doing that. And then I continue in the game. <laughs> that's cute. That's good. So at the start of every month in the game, the students need to set their budget. So let's do that. First, I'm told how many hours I'm working at my job. I got 24 hours each week, which is not too bad. So 432 times 4. Looks like I'm going to have a gross income of 1728 this month, which we show them uh, removing some of the, or adding tips, removing some tax. They're going to get about $1,500 take home. Sounds good. And then we're going to compare that against the bills they have. So here's all the bills that they have set. Um, they, we know all the stuff that you set as the teacher. 
And then we want to train the students to understand how to estimate the expenses that aren't just going to be coming in as a bill. So for the first month, this estimate your other expenses is really a blind guess. The students are not going to have any idea, but every month afterwards, we're going to show them how much they spent last month so they can get better and better at getting an accurate target there, which gives them their total estimated expenses. And then the last set is for them to set their savings goal. So one of the things that we're trying to force on them is to be able to consistently save 10% of their income regardless of what kinds of expenses they have. So a real pay yourself first strategy. So I have no money in my savings account now. Um, we are we encourage them to save 10%. So I'm going to save 160 bucks. So uh, it's 10%, which is good. It should be pretty easy to save that because I'm making so much money. So that sounds good. But if I try to set really hard savings goals, like I want to save $700, then it's the difficulty gauge gets pretty high. So just so students know what they're looking at. Just, I was going to ask you something real quick too, as far as like a we, we use that term like PYF, um, pay yourself first. Does that, however, does that actually come up as, as one of those lessons prior to them setting their own savings or not really? It doesn't come up for the first time because we're trying not to overload okay. them with everything, but by the end of the first month, they will get one that comes up that brings that up. So they'll have to keep that in mind okay. for the second month moving forward. Okay. Okay. So let's start the month, and as soon as I start the month, I got my rent bill. So I need to choose whether I'm paying with my debit card or my credit card. So I'll pay with my debit card for now. Um, I can pay it off pretty easily. I have plenty of cash, um, especially if the students don't get that many hours in each month. They might have to choose to put off their bills or use their credit card or make some other decisions. And then right here, I finish my first dice roll, and at the end of each dice roll, I get one of those unexpected events. So it looks like I broke a frying pan and need to buy a new one, 30 bucks. Um, I'll use my credit card for that transaction. So other stuff I'm looking at here, I can see my bills on the side here. If I don't pay them right away, I get a big flashing alert telling me I need to pay it. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but some of these um, cells are green with a big question mark. Uh -huh. Those are the ones where those special lessons pop up. Um, so they can kind of see mm -hmm. them coming in advance. I have uh, and those game. are the ones you get by default or the ones that I had to set? These are all by default. So anything I okay. is by default. Any lesson that you set separately will appear on the right side of the page here. Oh, got it, got it, okay. Um, the other stuff I have available is game score is an important one. So game score is a few things put together. One of them is your quality of life points just go straight into your game score. Um, as you improve your credit score, that also goes in your game score, but you know it counts a lot more. So every time you increase your credit score by one point, your game score will go up by 20 points. Or um, five points, something along those lines. <laughs> a lot. Um, and the other way they get their game score is by hitting their savings target by the end of the month. So if I save that $160 that I said I was going to, transfer that to my savings right now. Now at the end of the month I'm going to get another um, I think 60 points or, or 600 points. Yeah, 600 points actually. So that'll go in there too. And the biggest bump boosts they can get to the game score is if they build up their emergency fund to certain thresholds. So if I save up um, $500, which I can do, I have enough money right now, I'll save another um, $340. It means I'm going to hit my $500 savings balance, which is my first threshold for my emergency fund, and I just got 2,000 points for that. So the students who have an emergency fund early are going to be doing the best in the game, basically. But once they have the emergency fund built up to $1,000, then, then the game changes a little bit where they get the most points by hitting their savings goals, but also making sure they build their quality of life, too. Um, so I'm going to pay off my credit card. Excuse me, Kevin, you, Kevin, I'm just going to, I need to shut the door. Can you hold on just a second? Sure. Just, just a second. Okay, thank, you. thank you for waiting. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. Make sure I can hear you. <laughs> so are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, as far as I feel like my eyes are all over the place, which is not not a problem. Is I'm just I think it's just excellent. But I was curious. Um, I know you're calling. It sounds to me like 
it's synonymous from um, savings balance to emergency fund. Those are synonymous terms for this game. So your emergency fund is the first thousand dollars of your savings balance. You won't get any more emergency fund bonus after you've saved a thousand dollars. But you but are still expected to save these goals. Excuse me? But even after you save up that first thousand dollars, you're still expected to hit your savings goals and keep transferring money in. Okay. And was did I miss where that was somewhat explained to the student? Like was that on the right that explained what the emergency was? So the emergency fund is explained if I refresh oh. That's okay. So it's in a few places. The first place is if I go into the game for the first time and I click how to play, mm -hmm. we explain oh, okay. it in some detail. Um, mm -hmm. It's good. okay. Okay, so, yeah, I looked at this too on your website. Yeah, that is a good one. Okay. It's okay if the students don't understand the emergency fund right at the beginning of the game. That's kind mm -hmm. of expected. Um, we also okay. get into the emergency fund quite a bit in these um, lesson cards. Got so it. The first month and has four of them. You can't click on those lesson cards until you get there. You can't just randomly click on them. It has to be on that day. Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, so the idea basically is the first month is basically a tutorial month where the students are just kind of mm -hmm. getting their bearings of what all the different parts mm -hmm. do. By mm -hmm. the time they go through all four of the lessons from the first month, they'll have they'll know what the emergency fund emergency fund is. They'll know they'll get points for it. They know that they need to build up their credit score by paying off their credit card on time. They know the difference between using their debit card and their credit card, and they understand you know a lot of the mechanics. Um, from there, after the first month, there are still lessons each month. I think there's an average of two every month, but they get more into the nuances of. What do you do if you can't pay off all your bills on time? What does it mean to actually pay yourself first in that context? It's, you know, you okay. know putting the transfer the savings first and then putting off the bills if you need to, that kind of thing. So I just kind of went through it real quick, but you saw on the Friday I got That's my okay. paycheck, yeah. which went in, and mm -hmm. on the Saturday, every Saturday, the students choose how to spend their weekend. They can work extra hours okay. for more money. They can study. They can do a bunch of other stuff. Uh-huh. So that's the gist of it. That's how the students play the game. Um, there are rankings for the game as well. So if I go to my rankings page, um, I have you know my overall game score, which is a lot of that is the savings bonuses and the emergency fund bonuses. They can also see their ordering by net worth, by credit score, and by their quality of life. So different students might prioritize different things, but generally speaking, the students with the highest overall score are going to build their emergency fund fast. They're always going to hit their savings goals, but they're not going to go crazy. They are going to spend some money on consumption and building up their quality of life, too. Okay. And if they are just out of control and, they're, and they really run out of money, I mean, that does the game get them back on track? Yes. So if I'm in the budget game and I've spent all my money and my checking account balance is zero, my credit card is getting near its limit where I have almost no credit card balance left, instead mm -hmm. of giving a random event, at the end of the next dice roll, they're going to get a bailout check of $500 from their parents and their game, game score is going to take a huge hit. Okay. And while we're talking about game scores and rankings too, um, separately, um, do, can, they, can I set it up so that they can see one another scores? Yeah, so on the rankings page, they okay. can see all this stuff, um, and there's a details button where they can mm -hmm. see each other's like transactions in their checking account, so they can see the kinds of stuff that happened to them, um, mm -hmm. their savings, transfers, how many credit card transactions they made, so the students can see what each other are doing. And you recommend that, right? It's part of the game. Like, just it's nice. For this right? one, it's okay. And um, yeah. basically, the main thing is that for the first couple of months of the game, it's not really fair. The students aren't going to be getting different hours in their jobs, and so someone's going to have an advantage okay. over the other. It's not until they get to uh -huh. month four or five when things start to average out. Okay. Okay. So with all that together, um, just for reference, we are adding a bunch of new stuff to the games too. So one of the things was when we were talking about the um, graduation and all that stuff that's coming for the fall, that's going to be a, a major enhancement to the game. Another one is we're adding badges and gamification aspects to the game, where um, 
completing those lessons, for example, will give the student a badge that they can show off on the rankings page. And then you, as the teacher, when you create that assignment for your class, they can, um, you can say, by completing this assignment, I'm going to give you a bonus of $500 or something. Um, to kind of give them an extra incentive to actually get everything done on time. So, uh -huh. but both of those are coming pretty soon. The assignments upgrade is coming probably in April. So by the time you're using your classes, that would actually be um, pretty applicable. Do you think the badges and stuff would be there? The badges might not be, but the bonus points for completing the assignments will be. Oh, okay. So the badges are kind of coming April? throughout April and May um, into the summer. Okay. Okay. So, do you have any questions? Because that kind of covers most of the um, the real meat of it. Okay, I, I guess at this point, um, have you pretty much showed me that now what my my teacher side looks like once the students start playing? Am I or am, am I see, how how am I seeing what it looks like? So all of your stuff Just that you want is up in administration, and we go to uh -huh. the the real good stuff is in the reports. So the reports. most of these okay. reports deal with the stock game because there's a lot of different data to look at. The big one okay. for the budget game is this one here, which gives you a lot of the same information that you would see on the uh, rankings page. On the rankings page, okay, so, it's similar to it's similar rankings. To um, could I set myself up as a? I mean, could I have? Could I pretend that I'm a student in this situation? Could I? So yeah, if you, I mean, this, with your teacher account, you can play the budget game, you can play the stock game, and you'll be in the rankings if you want to be, yeah. You don't need to create a separate account for it, we just let you do it. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. Um, is there also a way for me to do like a dry run of just myself before I set up my students? Just play it myself a little bit? So the easiest way that most people do it is they we give them their teacher account, they just create a like a test class and they use it just for themselves and they create a new one when they have okay. their students come in. Got it, got it, okay. All right, and I don't wanna take up a ton of your time today, but something I'd just like to tell you is, I mean, guaranteed, this is probably something I would love to see in the fall when I'm more prepared and I can truly do it correctly to supplement my curriculum. At this point, I, and I appreciate your guidance here, especially if I'm putting in a requisition for this, um, is I'm probably going to have to contain it to just one of my classes, and it's going to have to just be the budget game because they're all seniors, and they're going to be crazy busy, and they're done at the end of May. Their classes are over. Sure. So do you think uh, if I just went budget game for these seniors, they, they could have fun with it for two months, or is that even stretching it? Is that too long for them to maybe play this game? Two months, it should be fine. Um, most of the time, the students aren't going to be playing it for very long. At you know, in one sitting, probably 20, 30 minutes at a time. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend having a twenty-four month game in that case. Mm -hmm. And I honestly would recommend turning on the stock game in case they want to try it. It doesn't cost you any more. Um, and if they they're interested in it, they're interested in it. If not, the budget in game is the meat, uh, is the full star of the show for you. Okay. I'm I'm just I'm just really not seeing a ton of time. Period. Yeah, no, don't, <laughs> I'm not don't worry a about it. Time, you you use what you think you can use. I know it sounds a little contradictory, <laughs> but I, I'm just not seeing any time extra time just because it's not the only thing we're doing and I'm, I'm just really trying to supplement a bit from the lack of their you know the other side of their internship so yeah so then stick with the stick with the budget game um you can even set it up for 12 months and then you'll just see uh -huh. how fast the students go through it if they go through it super uh -huh. fast you can add more months to it and let them keep playing if they are kind of dragging their feet then you don't need to add anything else you can just leave it at 12. Oh, okay got it okay all right. Um, so, what do you see as next steps? Do you guys? Do I need to tell you the tell you my student numbers so that I can I can create a requisition for this, or what would be the next steps? 